Uh, so the title of this presentation is Ethno-Racial Variations in Recovery from Severe Mental Illness. And as I said, I would like to spend the first four or five slides just introducing the concept of recovery to everybody. Uh, and the concept of recovery is a renewed concept. So this, we're not using the term recovery in the present day as we used to use it in the 20th century. There are numerous definitions and models of recovery. Uh, and I'm going to introduce you to some of them in my next slides. But some of the commonalities in these definitions, which I would just like to spend a few moments telling you about, is that when we talk about recovery in mental health sciences, psychiatry now, we're not refer referring to the same thing as cure. When people define recovery, when patients talk about recovery, when clinicians, progressive clinicians think about recovery, they think that recovery involves people with me mental illness, severe mental illness, getting back into normative everyday activities. Uh, these normative everyday activities include things like having a job, having a girlfriend, having a boyfriend, having a house or an apartment, independent living, taking part in leisure activities, going to a cafe and having a coffee with a friend, socializing. These are the kind of things in the more acute stages of a psychotic episode or in the, the, the stormy months after a, a first episode uh, are generally kind of denied people. People are hospitalized. They often lose their housing. Uh, occasionally they get in trouble with the law, etc. So recovery really means trying to get back to uh, some kind of life which is meaningful, normative, and everyday. Recovery also involves choice and autonomy. So in all of the studies which we uh, we have done uh, qualitative researchers, quantitative researchers, that people in recovery say they want choice, they want autonomy. They want to choose if they work or not, what kind of job they do. They want to choose the kind of housing configuration they live in. Uh, they want to choose their treatment. They would like to have a range of options, whether it be medication, talking therapy, uh, vocational rehabilitation, psychosocial interventions, and they want, that, they want to have that choice. Uh, and this is, again, in contrast to previous models in psychiatry, which were much more paternalistic, where people with severe mental illness were often treated almost like children, where they were not given so much choice, not given so much autonomy, where people were telling them what to do, whether it be parents, teachers, psychiatrists. Uh, and the final theme that I put there is recovery is a long and arduous process. So most of the qualitative studies that people have conducted with people with mental illness say that recovery is a process. It's an uphill struggle. It involves a lot of work. Sometimes it involves two steps forward, one step backward. But it is something which is a process and is ongoing. So it's not, an out, not necessarily an outcome. So in, in traditional 20th century psychiatry, recovery was often seen as symptom remission, as an outcome, uh, a, as an end, whereas now it's seen more as a process uh, referring to functioning in the psychosocial domain. Um, I just wanted to show you this, uh, this cartoon by a fellow who has mental illness, who writes cartoons. And you can just see there, that's to him the road to recovery. It involves detours. So there's a classic definition of recovery by Bill William Anthony, which is the most cited paper on recovery, which comes from 1993. And this was a pivotal moment uh, in the thinking in mental health services. Uh, and Bill Anthony says that recovery is a deeply personal, unique process of changing one's attitudes values, feelings, goals, skills, and or roles. It is a way of living a satisfying, hopeful, and contributing life, even with limitations caused by the illness. Recovery involves the development of new meaning and purpose in one's life as one grows beyond the catastrophic effects of mental illness. So you'll see this cited in almost every recovery paper, or so in the introduction, introductory paragraphs, Anthony is constantly cited. I'm not sure everyone's read his complete paper, but everybody knows this paragraph. <laughs> Uh, this is a definition from the uh, United States Substance Abuse Mental Health Services um, uh, Administration. You can see it overlap with the previous definition. Mental health recovery is a journey of healing and transformation, enabling a person with a mental health problem to live a meaningful life in a community of his or her choice while striving to achieve his or her full potential. So you see the commonalities, transformation, meaning, purpose. These are the kind of key words which we associate with recovery. These are some of the components of recovery. So SAMHSA also issued a document where they said recovery has various components. Not everybody agrees with the precise dimensions. There's many models. But I think this is useful just to get a bit of an overview. Recovery, hope, respect, peer support, holistic, nonlinear, empowerment, person-centered. So 
So these are the kind of concepts which are used within the wider rubric of recovery. And I just wanted to give you a brief history of the idea of recovery. Uh, as I said, this term is largely ab absent from 20th century psychiatry. <coughs> if it is present, it is really referring to recovery as an outcome or to recovery as a, uh, uh, as a symptom remission. So the, the renewed reinvention of the term recovery is really a 21st century phenomenon. Uh, the Anthony paper in 93 was a bit of a watershed, but then it took time for recovery to become more mainstream. My second bullet point there says that it's a recent response to nihilistic and paternalistic thinking about people with severe mental illness. So as I said, in the 20th century, there was often a feeling that people with mental illness, it was a, even schizophrenia was a, was a chronic disease, that it was universally deteriorating, that the best kind of life people could hope for was stabilization, was going to a day treatment center, making raffia mats or uh, wicker baskets. Uh, and, and doing these kind of activities which most people felt were kind of mindless. And the recovery paradigm really is a 180 degree shift to try and think more positively and optimistically. And when talking about recovery, it's a bit of a nebulous phrase, so it's important to think, well, there's a recovery model. Well, I would say there's many recovery models which have a lot of overlap. There's a recovery paradigm, which is the kind of how all the different models fit together. There's a recovery movement, so there are recovery activists who have recovery conferences who try and push for change at um, different jurisdictional levels, federal level, province level, state level, etc. Uh, and there's this thing called recovery-oriented services, which are services which are deemed to help in recovery. Uh, I could give a whole presentation on this one slide, uh, maybe next time. <laughs> and recovery, even though it is somewhat of an ideology and there's a lot of rhetoric, in my opinion, as someone who's read a lot of the literature, the uh, quantitative and qualitative, recovery is supported by evidence by epidemiological, experiential, and ethnographic evidence. Many ep epidemiological studies have been conducted which show that if you follow up 100, 200 people with schizophrenia, severe mental illness over 10, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, uh, that you actually see 40, 50% of people with almost complete symptom remission. You see another 10 or 20% with a quite, quite a good partial symptom remission. And this is, even, this is just talking about recovery in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, and only very few are kind of refractory and, and need more intense care. Experiential, what do I mean by that? It's a, it's a fancy word for a simple concept. Many people with mental illness have written uh, autobiographies, personal accounts, small pieces of, on their blogs or in academic journals talking about the reality of their recovery. The most famous examples are people like Kay Redfield Jameson, Pat Deegan, um, Ellen Sachs. Uh, beautiful books, very touching, very moving, showing their own personal struggles with mental illness, but how they've m managed to live the kind of life in which is described in those introductions. Ellen Sachs, for example, she was hospitalized. She was doing a degree at Oxford in England. Um, she's American, um, and they, they, with support and help, she maintained her degree. She finished. She went back to the U.S. Again, she was hospitalized against her will, had many problems, told to drop out of university, got her legal degree and is now a a very well-known and respected professor of law at um, University of Southern California. And I mean, the people like Ellen are very articulate and have the capability to write, but there's lots of people with mental illness living that kind of life. Not necessarily being a professor, but that wasn't their dream. Just their dream was to be working somewhere to have a family, and that's what they're, they're living. Uh, and again, this is contrary to a lot of the stereotypes uh, and the way we, we thought in the 20th century. Uh, and the ethnographic evidence, lots of qualitative studies, people spend time with people with mental illness, observing, watching their lives, sit, seeing people progress in the domains previously outlined. Um, and if anyone is interested, there's a much more detailed discussion uh, in the May edition of the Canadian Journal of Psychiatry. Uh, a couple of good papers, a um, couple, uh, anyway, I was the author on one of them, so I'm giving myself a bit of a, <laughs> uh, a bit of a sell here. But uh, feel free to pass it around, and if anyone's interested, I have the PDFs. Uh, and I, I think they're good, not only because I'm the editor, but uh, they were re review papers aimed for the, the average psychiatrist. So um, even though the average psychiatrist is very uh, competent and intelligent, we kind of wrote it to try and as an introduction to the concept. It's not too technical and just an overview. And the aim of these overview papers is really to give a, uh, an easy access to introduction to people. 
And my final bullet point there, that the recovery paradigm has been officially mandated throughout the English-speaking world. Uh, and this is not really an exaggeration, or at least the major countries in the English-speaking world. If you look at the government of New Zealand, the government of Australia, the government of uh, Canada, the government of the UK, the government of Scotland, which is still part of the UK, um, just <laughs> uh, the United States, all of their governmental bodies, all of their ministries of health have said that, your, that mental health services must become recovery oriented. And there's lots of beautiful words on their websites about the importance of recovery and ministers of health. Of all these English speaking countries are giving um, uh, speeches about recovery and saying how important it is. What's actually happening on the ground does not always match the rhetoric uh, as is life. But uh, uh, it, it has been mandated, and that's a good start. When they start saying, yes, we want this, at least you have a wedge in the door to try and change things. Uh, and here in Canada, the Mental Health Commission of Canada, which is a kind of arm's length federal body, has really pushed recovery. It's a centerpiece of their mental health strategy for Canada. And this is the last slide of my introduction. Uh, cultural psychiatry and recovery. Uh, and this is where I really think, hopefully, my training with, with Lawrence and then also in uh, mental health services in, in London and in, in the US that, that makes me a little bit unique in the recovery world. Um, that there's really been no purpose-driven exploration of recovery in ethno-cultural minorities. That there's millions, not millions, I'm exaggerating, hundreds of papers on recovery in social work journals, psychiatry journals, uh, occupational therapy journals. Uh, virtually no purpose-driven research. And you often see some mention of culture or minorities but it's always an afterthought. It's always in the discussion or at the end of the results where somebody makes some bland statement like there were a few minorities and we didn't see any differences. And, um, uh, and you feel they were forced to do that by a reviewer at some point in the process. Uh, so this is a real gap in the literature. And my study wants to, um, uh, was an attempt to address that gap. Uh, a little bit of work. So myself did a study in Washington, DC, which uh, many of you know about, uh, where I was looking at poor, low-income African-Americans um, who had mental illness. Uh, and religion, religious resources were key to their recovery. And this was a qualitative study. They were, they were constantly saying to me that, that God, religion, prayer, um, listening to sermons on the radio, listening to religious music, uh, that was really the, the biggest facilitator to recovery for them. Uh, and I published a paper in Transcultural Psychiatry reporting those results. Uh, Neely Myers, who many of us know, uh, she did another ethnographic study at a clinic in Chicago, and she argued, reflecting on her data, that recovery reflects a lot of Euro-American values, which are kind of which people sneak in through the back door. That it's not a, a cultural concept. That it's not a necessarily a clinically neutral concept, but it's based on American values of rugged individualism, having a job, having a house, uh, being a kind of independent person, uh, standing kind of sentinel. Or everybody else around you. Uh, and it was an interesting paper, and it wasn't a kind of formal comparison between different ethnocultural groups, it was just based on a traditional ethnography in a clinic. Uh, and certain, certainly prompted a lot of thinking for those of us in the recovery uh, academia, academic world. Uh, my final bullet point there is that uh, nobody's really made a formal test of recovery in different ethnocultural groups, to my knowledge. Uh, uh, but Anthropological and social theory would suggest that the, the values and notions which Neely Myers talks about may not be shared across all ethnocultural groups. Uh, and our, our great collaborator, who's not here today, unfortunately, Adam Ola, Adam Ponder, and Lawrence and myself wrote a book chapter kind of talking about this and looking at theory and a bit of evidence and speculating about how the recovery paradigm uh, might not be completely applicable to minorities or might need to be tailored, better tailored. Or, and might reflect these Euro-American values.